same again. Nor will the United States automobile industry. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lee Iacocca. Crazy about you, Chip. shouldn't be surprised, like seven million he sold of his autobiography. Seven million? How many letters? 78,000? Yeah, about. Give or take a thousand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. And, he, had, and uh, he couldn't buy your lunch not long ago. And, and he got the heave-ho, you remember that? From Ford? I Henry. I Boom. remember. You remember. <laughs> Listen to this. I'll just, I'll be very brief. Chairman of the board of Chrysler Corporation since September 1979. Has been with Chrysler since November of 78. Mr. Iacocca spent 32 years with the Ford Motor Company. You know that. He rose from management trainee to president and chief operating officer. He is credited with creating the Mustang. And that was as big a hit as Detroit has ever seen. Boy, here it comes, here it comes. I remember the excitement. Um... As you know, his uh, wife, his first wife, Mary, uh, died in 1983. Uh, they are the parents of two daughters, both of whom have married in, in recently. His mother still gives him advice, and he calls her six times a week. It, I read it in the book. <laughs> Take her picture again. Uh, give him the monitors, uh, Brian. For, for the audience. That, here is Mrs. Iacocca. And you know what? She, he said, Ma, I bought American Motors. And she said, what for? That's right. You read the book, right? Or at you, least that part of it. You know, here you are as devoted a son if we are to believe your testimony, and I don't see any reason to doubt it, uh, you, took, you took your mother to White Sulphur Springs at a business convention yeah. where she sat next to the chairman of Motorola and right. probably gave him some advice, too. Right, right. Uh, she said, you have enough to do. She could still call you Lido? Lido. She said, you have enough to do. Well, uh, you didn't take her advice. Why not? You think if you stand still like your pa said, you fall backwards? Yes. You mean on American Motors? On anything. On, you know, I mean, why would your mother's advice not be valuable on that one? Well, she thinks I work too hard, like all mothers, that I should slow down a little bit and enjoy life. And uh, I listen to her, but then do what I want to do. How old are you, Mr. Atkoken? I'm uh, 63. No, really, I'm 64 in 10 days. I better come clean. <laughs> well, we want you to come clean. 64. Uh, and you, he seriously, seriously thought about running for president. No, I didn't. Where'd you read that? It's in here. <laughs> well, I, I thought about it for... Ten minutes, maybe, oh, one no, day. Oh, no, that's not the impression you leave the reader. <laughs> no, no, I, uh... There were people I, very serious, and you, you were... I listened to them, yeah. My mom, my kids thought I w wouldn't, wouldn't do well, that my temperament was such that I would uh, probably die quickly. And uh, I decided it was... Uh, actually, I was sitting in bed one morning, and I uh, was like this, and I... Uh, uh, it was a Saturday where I could sleep in, and I, I mused about being president. And I fantasized. And then I thought of the debt, and I thought of the trade deficit, and I thought of the homeless and the drug problem and education. And I, I kept thinking this. I pulled the sheet up over my head and didn't get up for about three hours. <laughs> right then I knew I had made up my mind. Uh, let it me was scary. Uh, you think that before, uh, when a man announces, or a woman announces for president, that you ought to give the voters some idea of who you would choose for cabinet. He does in his book. Here's who he would choose. And incidentally, 63, that is not, uh, you're not ancient, Kim. Forget it. Well, all right, but let's give him. Sam Nunn, Vice President. Iacocca Nunn. Don Rumsfeld, Secretary of State. You remember him? Was with the Ford administration and then, uh, Mer uh, and then uh, Searle. Jack Welch, the guy who runs uh, this he, shop here, he, uh, he NBC. Owns, he owns your company. Yeah. Well, it isn't my company. We're tenants here. They're our company. customers. <laughs> 
You're close to owning it. They're our customer, and they're always right. Uh, Jack Welch is the, uh, you want him for Secretary of Defense. He's the chairman of the board of one of the largest defense suppliers, and he's like fifth. He or... understands it. All right, Felix Rowanton and Paul Volcker, or Paul Volcker for Treasury, Peter Uberoff for Commerce, Doug Fraser for Labor. He likes Douglas Fraser, former UAW boss. He was on your board. And for Secretary of Communications, Tom Brokaw. This is a new job. It's a new job, and he says he'd use them to cover Sam Donaldson. All right, let's talk now. We got uh, Let's see how much we can cover here. Go. All right. Um, You'd like, uh, the, President Reagan called you from the ranch. He was actually chopping wood to express his concern about your wife's well-being at a time when we know now she had very little time left. You were very touched by that. Very. Um, you visited him at the White House and he really didn't say anything. And then suddenly all the white coats were dismissed and Reagan started pouring French wine to, for his guests, saying, don't tell the guys. In California, they'll right, kill, they'll me. kill but me. I found this. Right. And he's born. As charming a guy as you'd ever want to meet. Absolutely. And you think he's a lousy president. Well, not lousy. I mean, he did a lot the first four years. But uh, after, after the first term, I think that there were so many problems that weren't addressed and that we're going to face them for the next 20, 30 years. Mostly debt. But he did a good job. He uh, gave the country hope. He built up the defenses of the country. He uh, cut taxes. Any time you talked to him about something, he would drift off into an anecdote. At once he gave the punchline, the show was over, and you were out the door. He was a great storyteller, just a charming person. But you do seem to be backing up now on what is very, and, and incidentally, this appraisal. I'm not, you know, I know you probably don't get a big kick out of bashing presidents, and I know that that's not. You've already told us that you think he's a wonderful human being, but you do not think he's a good president at all, not even a little bit. I don't think he'll be a great president. I think for the time he was a good president. I think after the so-called malaise, after Nixon, then after uh, Carter, uh, yeah. we needed a little respite. We needed a little okay. rest, and he gave us that kind of morning in America talk, and we wanted that. That's what the public wanted. We liked it. But is, so, it, is it honest or is it self-deceptive? Well, only history will tell that. I don't know. I, I think we now have a lot of problems facing us, and the next eight years are going to be tough, some of the worst. Here's what you told your Chrysler people. You know, in life, there are some people you meet you just like to pal around with. They're fun. They put you in a good frame of mind, and they make you feel terrific. Well, that's Ronald Reagan. He's not Dr. Strangelove. He's Dr. Feelgood. Right. I, I want him to be my pal, but not my president. Well, I still feel that way. I, I would love to uh, go horseback riding with him. I would love to have dinner with him. Uh, when it comes to some of the affairs, the tough problems of today, I think he... Uh, in the second term, for sure, drifted away from what the issues of this facing this country are. Right. Okay. I, we, you got so much in here, so you just forgive me. Now you don't have to talk fast, but we. I want. Uh, let's see if we can get because these people want to get you too. Um, Bruce Springsteen wouldn't play the Liberty Gala. Never heard from him. The boss never called back. Would you believe that? You wanted him for the Meadowlands, where you were going to have the guys All who. All the working men, right? Yeah. He, uh, Born I, in the USA. I don't know whether I never talked to Bruce. I don't know him, but his agent never called back twice. You got fired because there's a conflict of interest between raising the money and appropriating it. Is that it? That's what they said. Fired. The guy you, who, the guy you're who the raised, wealthiest guy who <laughs> ever got fired in, your, in my you know, right. I've ever heard. The guy, the guy who raises it's a government idea. The guy who raises the money should never be accountable for it. I didn't agree with that. So I thought if we raise $300 million from the American people, we should be the ones to tell them how to spend it. And they said, no way. Park Service will take over from here on in. They fired me. Uh huh. Your father took you twice to see the Statue of Liberty as a kid. Yep, twice. And you, as wonder, a little kid, you wonder about people who live in New York and never even seen the thing. I know. I had some congressmen as we approached uh, Statue of Liberty, the hundredth anniversary, that had never been here, so they hurriedly called up and said, "We better go over and see it." Yeah. Because they'd never been there. You know, uh, Donald Regan was here, right was. there, sat right there. I had lunch with Are him about a month ago. You did? Yeah. You had lunch with Donald Regan? Yeah. He wrote me a letter and said, let's bury the hatchet. We call each other names so long, why don't well, we stop this? It was very nice of him. Yeah. He, you, bought, he bought the lunch, yeah. you know. <laughs> you, uh, you called him a nasty son of a bitch. I think he called me something uh, akin to that. <laughs> oh, he called you a nasty son of a bitch. I don't remember, but we called each other names. You we wanted, didn't get along too well. You wanted, but, you wanted to keep an executive jet following Oh, us. no, it had nothing to do with that. Huh? that I read what, it in that, his book. That was trivial. Well, he took trivial stuff. Uh, he, uh, 
And you he, you wanted to reduce the uh, the uh, the service uh, charge I really from one percent to one half percent. I just figured I was paying them back seven years early all this money, this billion two hundred million. That Chrysler and he wanted to sell these warrants, these pieces of paper, and 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 he won. But it cost me three hundred fifty million dollars profit to the government to buy them back. I thought he should have cut them back a little bit because they were ten year warrants, and maybe I'd pay him thirty percent of the three hundred million. But I lost. I didn't think I, I. I thought I got a bad deal. Well, you know, the, but the, not a few taxpayers would argue. Look, we already gave you one point two guaranteed. Bill, B as in boy, billion. Yeah. All right, hooray for you. Not all of us were crazy about that. We thought this was America, the land of the free enterprise. So, all right, we did it. And I'm, well, what do you know? You pay us back. Yeah. But now, now you want more. No, no. Yay. Now you wanted a profit of three hundred and fifty million on the billion two, and that was almost usury. I thought that was too much to pay. But anyway, that's it. Right. That's yeah. really you what you had. A nice about. lunch then with Donald Reed. Nice lunch. Um, <laughs> I always figure it cost me three hundred fifty million dollars. I'd like. You thought seriously about buying General Motors? Tell the people. Well, not seriously. Oh, again. Sure now, here we go. See? It's like a fantasy. I said it wouldn't be nice. To, uh, any, anybody, anybody can be raided nowadays. It's a shame, but that's the truth of the matter. So a couple of guys came to me and said they have so many assets, why don't we at least look at it? We looked at it for about a day, and then we chuckled ourselves at that, as I said in the book, it would be easier to buy Greece, a country, <laughs> than General Motors are so big, and they needed $40 billion to buy it. So we dreamt a little bit. We thought big, but... Uh, that was the end of it. Victor Potemkin, one of New the York. biggest GM dealers in the world. New Yorkers are familiar with his name. Victor. Called and said he had to see me. It was very important. Understand this guy now. He's got about, according to you, 50 dealerships, including a couple of Chrysler and Dodge franchises. Right. He's got mostly GM, though, doesn't he? Yeah, mostly GM. So here comes Victor. Sits down with the big guy here. After, he says to you, after talking to a lot of large dealers, he said the consensus was that if I took you... If Iacocca took over General Motors, Iacocca could save them. Well, he went beyond that. I didn't put it in the book. He said, I have $100 million to chip in. I can get a few guys together. And I said, uh, Victor, $100 million. We need $40 billion. That won't cut it. He said, but we can get it financed, and we can do like all these other guys do. We can take them over, sell off their hot assets, take on a lot of debt, get some junk bonds, pay it off. That's what's going on in the country today. I didn't cotton up to that, so we really never got serious. I mean, General Motors is... Uh -huh. It's pretty big. It's yeah. as big as most countries. You yeah. really give them a shot for the Saturn. You think that was all hype and no... Substance? Well, time will tell. Maybe I'll be proven wrong, but it was a lot of hype. I mean, a lot of hype. A lot of bizazz. Razzmatazz, you say. Yeah, In effect, sense. GM is simply announcing another Chevy for 1990. This is not the new car, as Mr. Iacocca is telling his readers. That uh, And then... Even, uh, and it's true, you make the point, uh, the point that four governors even showed up on the Donnie Show to beg the nation to support them in this runoff. Yeah, you had them. I did. I don't know if beg is the word they necessarily agree with, but... Uh, <laughs> so you saw this. You, in a way, you were kind of jealous, weren't you? I mean, they knew how to get the public's ear, huh? It was fantastic. I wish I had thought of it. It was a great <laughs> PR program. Actually, had everybody fighting to, to see if they could give them tax money to have the plant land in their state. And they, they hit about 40 of the 50 states, actually, and uh, yeah. they got a lot. You also tell your readers how shocked you were at the, at the positive results that you achieved when you went on TV and you said, we goofed. We're sorry. You mean on the odometers? Odometers. Well, I told the truth. We goofed. And I told the public that uh, it won't happen again, and I was sorry, but we'd make amends by paying them. And we did that, and it went away in 24 hours, and I always felt that that's what politicians should do. Come clean. In other words, if Reagan had gone on television and said, look, I'm li I was yeah, really, uh, they, were, they were torturing our hostages, I couldn't, I led with my heart, I asked this nation to stand with me now. Stay with me. Oh, he would have Standing strike. ovation. It would have been, yes. Now, what is this? He got this? bad advice. Huh? He got bad advice or he wasn't thinking that day. Because when you make, when you goof up, the first thing you do, you got to come clean. You got to be honest. If you do that, most people will rally around you. They may say you're stupid. But they won't think you're dishonest. And I think that's what happened in Irangate. They felt that they were covering something. They didn't come clean. Yeah. I would advise anybody, young people, anybody, if you make a mistake like that, just lay it out. Lay it out. If you make a mistake with your parents, tell them you made a mistake. You might get the hell beat out of you, but, but <laughs> you learn from it. So I, that's all I was trying to say in the book. I understand. Now, it will not please you 
if I call this uh, audience's attention to the fact that uh, Chrysler now finds itself in another, we got to call this a scandal. You have put out 400 lemons out there, and you have you've recalled them. You paid the people. You said, "I'm sorry, these weren't the cars that we promised you they were, and the law obliges, and we take them back." And you, and then you sold them as demos, and you have not told the new customers. You've, you've called them demonstrators. Now, this will just take a moment, Mr. Iacocca. The New York Daily News, the same beloved paper that ran on the occasion of the odometer scandal, your picture, the worst Wait. picture, your mother must have thought that you were ill. Would you buy a used car from this man? Would you buy, <laughs> buy a used, used car, car from, from this, this man? man? This is after the odometer. <laughs> and it said you, already, you may have already. <laughs> yeah. Here comes the Daily News again. Editorial. It's fine as far as it goes that Attorney General Robert Abrams has nailed the Chrysler Corporation for violating New York's Lemon Law. The law requires auto companies to repurchase vehicles that are out and out duds. Chrysler complied, but resold some 400 lemons as demonstrators. Chrysler has agreed to give the victims refund and free repairs, but what about the next step? Bringing criminal charges against the exec who provided over, who, execs who presided over this scam. The company claims that it was an inadvertent oversight. That might wash if there were one or two cars, but 400? Come on. That smacks of deliberate fraud. Those responsible, are, and not just low-level employees, should stand trial for it. Well, what do they want to do, send me to jail? What are you saying? That sounds what, <laughs> that's what they're saying. Now, wait a minute. It's true. It was inadvertent. It was a goof. It's stupid to do it. 500,000 cars were sold in New York State. Out of the 500,000 cars, 400 cars were declared lemons under state law. Of those 400, uh, uh, they shouldn't have been sold without having told the person that these were lemons. So we said to them, look, we made a mistake. We'll buy them back. We'll do whatever it takes. 200 of the people liked the lemons so much they didn't want to come back. The other 200 were paying off. It's costing us a million, two million dollars. And it's an absolute goof. It shouldn't have happened. But there's nothing criminal about that. We have to take, uh, see the people who weren't smart enough in the administrative end to not have markies. There are 40 lemon laws in 40 different states. They vary all over the lot. It's a rather complex subject, but it shouldn't have happened. Yeah. So I'm sorry about that, too. Uh -huh. Twice I'm sorry with you today already. <laughs> Don't you think there's anything good in the book? <laughs> um, now, don't get crazy. Don't get crazy. I do not think that America's uh, strength and integrity will be enhanced if we send Ayacocca to the slammer. I do gently, however, ask you whether or not as a nation we're being honest with ourselves and whether or not the auto industry and most big business itself is not engaging in the same kind of self-delusion. You know, Detroit did not acknowledge for a long, long time in the 60s that the Japanese were building a better car. When a Yahoo from West Germany landed a plane in Red Square, they, the Soviets, chopped, fired the head of the entire military apparatus. Of, you have to pay a price in that country. For, what, what price are the powerful paying for their goofs? This is not an inadvertent, as the Daily News points out. Do, how, doesn't that bother you a little bit? The big guys get away. Well, I don't know that the big guys get away. I, I, I mean, we, we tried to make amends to the people for a mistake we made, but I don't see anything criminal about it. It shouldn't happen again. You might fire a couple of the guys. I was in Italy when I read about it. In fact, I didn't even know about it. You say, you don't know that things are going on in the company. Uh, all you can do is do more than apologize. You've got to make good. So we're going to pay these people and, and, and make sure it doesn't happen again. That's about as much as I can tell you. But your broader subject, are we all too tolerant of all kinds of mistakes in a country? Yeah, I think there's a lack of discipline. I think in many areas there's a lack of integrity, of honesty. And I think it's paralyzed us in many parts of, of our society, including our own government and business and unions. Um, you, uh, you tell a very moving story about the, your, the, the marriage of your first daughter. Kathy is your older of the two? Yeah, she's here. Yeah. Uh, what father would not identify with how you feel? You put a number on her, a countdown number on her, uh, the yep. number of days left? Right. Does she play a game? Yeah. 25 days till the yeah. wedding? Yeah. And then what was, what'd you do on the wedding day? You give her a zero? How'd this go? I said no days to go, zero, and then I gave her a necklace and some earrings for mm. her wedding present. 
You tell the reader, and it's very moving, that uh, how much how much uh, her mother was missed that day, and that you had the feeling that maybe that you know somehow her mother would be there at the when you got to the end of the aisle on the oh, altar. Yeah. What father who's been who's a widower couldn't identify with that? Yeah. Then you had another uh, marriage, you, you, your other daughter. And you're crazy, you got lucky, do you? Son, sons-in-law are good guys, huh? Good guys. You're a boy, lucky. it's a good thing. I don't want you mad at me, kid. I'll tell you. <laughs> um, and you, you never missed a swimming meet? You never missed a piano I, recital? I don't think ever. Maybe once in a while if I was traveling. That's, uh, that's something. For a why? big shot like you, well, you well, know, why? you guys are always in your executive jets flying well, around. Well, that's, that's where everybody today feels that way. I mean, uh, family life in many areas has gone plumb to hell, and uh, I cherish my family, I cherish my daughters, and I think most of this audience does. Every chance you have, you tell them you love them, you go stroke them, you see them, they're growing up, uh, they'll reflect you all their lives. What's so strange about that? That has nothing to do with whether you're rich or poor or black or white. You've got to have love of family. I mean, I don't know why that's so unnatural. Yeah. No, it, 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 obviously, we're on your team. We agree. We agree that that's a good idea. Um, this audience uh, is entitled to know, Mr. Iacocca, and you are entitled to ignore the uh, Question. reference. You're, you give us a very honest and I think very conservatively and lovingly drawn portrait of your marriage to a woman a generation younger than you in which I think you present uh, yourself very honestly confused very eating alone was bad enough but living alone really scared me dying alone scared me even more you tell you you draw your uh, uh, an autobiographical picture of yourself as a very lonely guy you're eating alone at night this is mr. chairman of the you know what he's eating he's alone uh, and then you met her during the uh, all the poobah with the uh, statue and you were you were tentative boy you didn't think and not surprisingly a lot of people wrote and said you follow your heart don't don't worry about the, what the people say and middle-aged women were telling them to marry somebody your own age that's right they said pick on someone your own age um, now, and after, uh, I don't know how long the marriage was, eight months, I don't know, um, the worst happened. And you tried to reconcile. They went to a marriage counselor. She didn't want to move. She did not want to move to Detroit from New York. One very major problem. You know, you tell your viewers, I still had a lot of love for that girl. Even as they walked out of the divorce thing. But I'm not going to ask you to comment because I'm on, I am told that you've been that you've asked us not to discuss this on the air. Well, I mean, it's in the book, so you can't. I'm not a bad guy for it. Um, 63, you are? You're out of here a couple of years, you know. I have a contract with the company until I'm 67. Oh. Is that good? I think so. You don't want to yeah. go fishing? No. Nope. Not really. Every day, I wouldn't want to go fishing, uh -huh. play golf. Got to keep active, so I'll stay with the company, and then, uh, then we'll see. Said in the book, I may teach school for a while. I, I don't know. Uh, I got a lot to say. Yes. Uh, you also say in the book that maybe you've got to deal with the, the, it's a, on the issue of after your divorce. Maybe I have to learn to live with the hand that was dealt me, and that's to be alone for the rest of my life. Sounds bad, doesn't it? No. Did I, did I say it that way? That's no, all it says here. Well, uh, everybody's got to live with hand dealt them. You know, you got to handle things as they come along. Some things don't work out. Are you more out. adjusted now? To, you, you can't be any nicer sitting there alone. Are you still eating alone? Mostly. I travel a lot, though, and have company. And, uh, but generally, life is quieted down quite a bit. Mm -hmm. i got to just get one more thing in. His mother called him during all this divorce stuff and says, You have to work at it. <laughs> work at it. Work at it more. Hey. Like a mom. Yeah. Should all have moms and sons like the Iacocas here present. And we'll be back in just a moment. President Regan, that you weren't too uh, pleased with him. Sir, who kind of stands out in your mind as one of the most outstanding presidents that you have voted for? We talked about this in the book. Uh, well, Harry Truman, but I didn't vote for him. My wife did. She bet me 15 to 1 that he would win, and I said, no way. 
and he turned out to be one of the great presidents of all time. Mr. Sure. Iacocca, uh, I'd like to ask you what do you think about uh, uh, Bush uh, nominate, nominating on uh, getting uh, Quayle to run with him? How do you, what do you think about Quayle, President Quayle? I don't feel very good about it. I, uh, I think it's the choice of, of the nominee, in this case, Mr. Bush, to pick whomever he chooses, but uh, this is a big country and there were a lot of tremendous people he could have chosen. I was literally stunned by it. I thought he'd pick Bob Dole or somebody. I just thought he would, but he didn't. Are you prepared to tell us for which tickets you will vote? Oh, no, no. I don't think anybody should ever tell anybody how they're going to vote. These guys count on your vote. Always. Never. Never. Uh, uh, Mr. Iacocca, I remember talking back to your commercial. You said, if you find a better car, buy it. I said, I did. And it was... <laughs> It was a Japanese Accord Honda, which I'm still driving. It's about seven years. Oh, well, that's a, a lot of people wrote that way. Thank God a lot bought our cars, too. Mm -hmm. Mr. Iancoca, I really believe in buying American-made cars, and I have always insisted that we buy an American-made car in my house, even though I'm outvoted. However, what disturbs me is that I'm finding out that even though I'm buying an American car, it's manufactured in Canada or in a foreign country. That's not helping the American worker. I think we have to do more here in this country for our blue-collar workers. Well, I agree about... Actually... <laughs> actually, you find as the world is changing, uh, it's called local content, how much of the total car is built here. In our case, it's about 85% of our total cars. Pieces do come from, in from other parts of the world. We would just hope that Japan would, would reciprocate and do the same thing because they don't do that. They're 100% Japanese and they send them in on wheels and that's the reason the trade deficit is so big on autos. But I don't think you'll ever see, we'll ever go back to where you have 100% of a car made in a country of origin uh, because the world is shrinking and, and you're buying from a lot of different places in the world. Our job is to get good quality and be cost competitive. We should be able to do it here. So, but, but the woman's point is it's, it's more and more difficult to make a patriotic argument for the purchase of an American, so-called, yeah. quote, American-made yeah, automobile. I, I have never made a patriotic argument. I, uh, I think we should try to buy American if, if we're equal on cost and price and quality. And 80 to 83, uh, we lost our way. Really, in the 70s, the Japanese did better quality work, and it showed up. They had better fuel economy when the Arab, uh, the OPEC crisis came. And we've worked now about seven or eight years, but we're just about there. We've plowed billions in, and we now have good cars. Um, you uh, believe that the American automobile, that Detroit, lost the baby boomers? Oh yeah, a lot of them. God, in California, just look at the numbers. What is? What are the numbers? What is the number of Japanese-owned uh, percentage of ja in California? Yeah. Well, in California, that's the biggest. In Hawaii, it's even bigger. The closer you get to Japan, probably 65 in, in Hawaii, 50 percent in Japan, and in the 50 nation. 50 percent in California. 50. And in the nation, about 23, but then you include Korea on top of that and the German cars. And, and then what do you about, get? About 30. So 30%. three out of every 10 cars is, a, uh, is an oh, import. Import. Yeah. And half of all cars in California yeah. are imports. Since I was on your show five years ago, uh, we've gone to an imbalance of trade with Japan on cars alone from about... Uh, well, in total trade, we've gone from 13 billion to 60 billion with Japan alone. Half of that is cars. That's how big they're selling the thirty billion uh, about of cars and parts and trucks in this country, and well, they sold two point three million here, and uh, Chrysler I think sold seven hundred over there, and yep. GM and Ford sold another thousand. We're not that bad, okay? They've got a lot going for them. They do a lot of good things, but there should be a better balance than that. Yeah. But we don't want to get into that today. That's the whole trade issue, and that's going to be facing the next president. If the next president doesn't handle that, I've told both Dukakis and Bush they're going to be one-term presidents. They've got to start to attack the two deficits, the budget deficit and the trade deficit. They right. have to tie them together. Uh, it, it, Chrysler owns what percentage of Mitsubishi? 14? Or, well, or is it more? It, we once had an option to go to 35, but we never took it years ago. We started 18 years ago. We now own about 24 24. Percent. Yeah. So you own 24% of a Japanese conglomerate, a multinational Japanese well, company. Well, not the conglomerate, just the auto. I wish I owned the part of the conglomerate. It's huge, the trading company. The auto company alone, Mitsubishi Motors, yeah. we own, we're a minority partner at 24%. But 
How does that influence? How, what, what is the honest answer to this question? How does that influence your, um, your power at the table at which you would hope to negotiate a relief from the dumping that you say is unfairly uh, making it difficult to sell American products in this country? Well, uh, nobody has any quarrel with owning a, a piece of a company or they owning a piece of our, uh, of our auto industry. Uh, I don't think that's the issue at all. Uh, the issue is that uh, when we started, we had, in 1970, Chrysler, when they could, didn't have the money, that's a long time, long before I got there, didn't have the money to do a small car. They invested in that company, which was a small company, to build them a small car, because they could, didn't have the $500 million right. to do their own. Right. At that time, the Japanese were getting 8 or 9% of the market, and we were selling 80,000, 90,000 cars, and that's what free trade is all about. We sold them something, they sold us something. Then the avalanche came, now they're up to 3 million cars. Now they're up to this 30 billion yeah. imbalance. But now the jobs are sailing out of the country. Now yeah. it's a different ball game completely. Right. You're never going to have a lot of American companies own a lot of German companies and English companies, either majority or minority. We can't own anything in Japan. It's very difficult to own anything in Japan. I know. All we would like is some reciprocity. I understand. But uh, just one more time. When the Japanese engage in what you would consider to be unfair trade practices in the United States, yeah. Chrysler benefits because you own 24% of a company that is doing this dirty deed. Not necessarily. It's not, it's not, not unfair. What, what do you mean, unfair trade practices? Well, I don't... you would call uh, certainly trucks, dumping trucks into the market below the cost? Well, yeah. Enhances if, the vitality? But if they're breaking rules under our regular conventions, if they're dumping trucks and selling, dumping is selling a truck for less money here than they do in Japan, we have rules. You handle that issue. The fact that we own 24% of a company, we can't say break our rules. We've got to retaliate. You see, there, there's a misconception in this country. We're, we're out of pocket $150, $160 billion a year in trade. We should be retaliating. We're the guys getting mugged. And everybody's worried about the other side. Uh, everybody's also worried about what, what happens to America's international companies that rely on their own well-being, rely on the international market for their own future. Boeing, to name one. Can't Boeing then get shut out if we start punishing? I don't have to tell you this. I mean, this is the whole... Uh, well, I don't believe in protectionism. There's got to be free trade, but there's got to be some balance. The train runs both ways. We're just not... They're not buying right. enough from us. Can That's you, all. Can you encapsulate for us, briefly, what is the Iacocca prescription for this agony? Well, the prescription is tough. All we want is to deal in our own self-interest and be fair. Japan doesn't break any rules. We tolerate them shipping in anything they want to our market, and they heavily restrict what we ship into their market. On top of that, then, we take care of all of their defense. These are the two things that have made Japan the great nation it is. So all we have to do is get their markets open. Now, the Congress of the United States just finished an 1,125-page bill on this subject, which says to the president, if we're getting hosed, you should stop it. He had that. He had all that uh, yeah. the possibility before. Right. So we have got to start dealing in our own self-interest. Right. And if they don't deal with us fair and square, all we've right. got to put a stop I to it. I get it. Now, suppose we get your ideal world in the international marketing community. What is it that Japan would want to buy from us? From us? Yeah. Well, they should be buying a lot of agricultural products. They got restrictions on everything. No beef, no citrus, no ravioli if they have beef in them. You can put cheese in them. But if you put beef in, they think we're smuggling beef in. Mm -hmm. they, they, they're, I, I say a lot in my book, I could have said more. Their restrictions are legion. They're dazzling, in effect, to keep our products out. They won't let us bid on their airport. They won't let us uh, send in skis. What do they say? Uh, on building at their airport, we don't know their soil conditions. O on ski, they have different snow conditions. They always have a reason why American products don't suit their market. The oranges are too big for them. They have little tangerines. They say their stomachs are small. <laughs> well, these are true. These are all the atrocities, but the truth is they have rigged up a series uh, of, uh, of things that are intended, literally, to keep a lot of products out of it. And, and we, with open arms, say, send us all you got. And when you're done with the year, they've got a $60 billion advantage in shipping us stuff and not buying ours. So they can buy a lot of things from us, especially food products, agricultural products, all kinds of things. Do we have, and, and they're benefiting by the fact that they are not investing much of their national wealth in military hardware. Oh my God, if we get into that, are they benefiting? The, the average person in Japan pays $164 toward defense. 
Every American taxpayer in this room pays about 1164 or a thousand more. To do what? To, for the free world, but we protect Japan. We protect the sea lanes so they can get their products in, their oil shipped. Right. That is unfair. That is absolutely unfair. And what this government's got to do... <laughs> if, if somebody's, somebody has got to face up and ask these very powerful, rich people now to share the burden as we did for 25 years after World War II. It's that simple. Do we have Mr. Iacocca's agreement that this country's rush to a 600-ship navy and the Reagan military buildup has shot us in the foot? It has not made us stronger. And the lesson is certain. The Japanese learned the lesson. Militarism almost destroyed the nation. They were in ashes in, 19, in the early 1940s. Now they may own the whole place. They, and, and one of the reasons for their strength is they decided not to throw all the hard work. Oh, no, they didn't decide not. We told them you can't. MacArthur saw to that after the war. They can't rearm. Yeah. Well, we maybe somebody sure ought to can't. tell us that. Uh, and then well, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll be the, the big I guy. I don't know. It's a complicated subject, but spending $300 billion a year, just think if you, I don't suggest we do this, but they argue where they can cut 5%. If they cut $300 billion to $150 billion, we'd have no deficit. If we had no deficit, we've had, a, we've, had, we've had real prosperity, a real economic prosperity. So why don't we just cut it in half? Instead, we're short $150. We borrow from Japan. That 150 billion, we pay them interest on it. It seems ironic. We pay them interest on yes. that 150 to defend them. Yes, that's right. Now, There's something now, wrong. One other thing. That let's, doesn't meet the let's test. Let's understand of this. Sense. This hand you got about. Uh, let's understand this. You can't become. You can't get elected to Congress or any other national office if you uh, if you say you're going to cut the defense budget. Well, yeah, they call you a communist. You can say if you, 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 you. I mean, they really do. But I just met with Frank Carlucci, who's a terrific Secretary of Defense. Uh, we might and expect he, that from an Iacocca. Right, a good Italian boy, a good Italian boy. Yes. <laughs> and, and he specifically said, he said very simply, I can cut 10 to $20 billion out of the defense budget and never cut personnel and never cut one arms program How? just by becoming a more efficient businessman. Let me budget multi-year. They budget every six months down there. Get rid of some of the fraud and the waste. Get Congress stopping the pork barrel all this. And we'll be back in just a moment. Nice looking couple or not? Well, you've done something right here, Mrs. Iacocca. You must be very proud of it. Very much so. He, uh, he not only went to Lehigh, he then, he goes to General Motors, then he went to Princeton. Went to Princeton, one year. You were how old, uh, uh, Mrs. Iacocca, when you came over? You, you were 17. 17 years old. Right. <laughs> yes, I bet you were. <laughs> well, uh, you certainly have done something right here with Lee Iacocca, who's gotten so much attention. I hope you bought uh, a copy of the first book. Yes, I, I guess I did. Maybe two of them. <laughs> uh, we should also say that uh, Mr. Iacocca's sister is here, Delma. We're glad uh, you're here. And daughter, Kathy, with an I. I'll remember that. And uh, Ned, just one of two of the greatest sons-in-laws in the world. We're glad you're here. Thanks for coming by to say hello. Yes, ma'am. Yes, how would you like to be remembered? You mean when I die? <laughs> <laughs> good family man, good strong kids. Lots of grandchildren, just had a grandchild four months ago. You waited up until 5 in the morning for Kathy to come home. Was it Kathy or Leah? Oh, you mean when they went out? In to... Florida. Oh, that was Kathy and Ned. It was 4.05, to be exact. 4.05. <laughs> was he in the driveway when you got home? Uh, yeah. He was in the kitchen. In the kitchen. The table. Yeah. Uh, you I was, never... I was cooking pasta. <laughs> <laughs> I was so nervous. Now, you know, she's married now. It's okay. Know, you can relax. Well. Uh, what's the moral of this story? You're never not a parent? I never relax. Why should our American money be worth less than Japan and Germany? We put them on their feet, and now we got it where we need it. Well, uh, they outproduced us, and we outconsumed them, and we goofed off for a decade, and we got to get with it, and the next president has got his work cut out for him. That's what he's got to do. We've got to produce more, consume less, we've got to save more, we've got to borrow less, we've got to export more, import less, and there may be some pain attached to that. But nobody wants to hear it. That's why you're not hearing from these yeah. two guys running for president. Um, that's right. And you also can't say that you'll raise taxes. Well, 
I guarantee you the next president of the United States is going to raise some taxes. What we should be doing right now is be discussing with us who are going to vote for these guys what kind of tax, if they have to, but they might lay on the, us. The American people will not tolerate that. They will Ask not Walter Mondale. Ask Walter Mondale. Right, he's bass fishing four years. He, all he did was say to Reagan, I'm going to raise taxes. Bang, oh, 49 states he lost. So how do you figure so, that then? How can, for all your, all your selling skills, and they are considerable, yeah. um, you can sell my widget anytime. You can't, even you couldn't do this. You are stepping here forward as a man, really, that's got a lot of power in that you don't, you're not asking for any public service. Well, I'm not running for office, but right. we are going to raise taxes. We will have to. There might be some pain for a while. It might be a consumption tax. It might be a gas tax. I'm on the National Economic Commission. You're laughing. So I'm not supposed to talk about it. But I, <laughs> but I'm not, I think before, it would be difficult to raise taxes if we had 10 or 20 billion dollars of waste, let's say, in the Defense Department or other departments. Before we cut that out, the American public wouldn't tolerate a tax increase. So we've got work to do. We, we are spending too much. Literally, we are spending too much. Congress, 535 guys, they never saw a spending bill they didn't like. They, get, they keep serving them up. Even the president gets too many of them. He doesn't know what to do with them. Yes. So we've got to freeze something and, and cool it for a while and cut some of these expenses. The key is, we as America, we own it. We don't want anything of ours cut. Right. And nobody, you never write your congressman and say, please start with me. Please cut something. Yeah. Please raise my taxes a bit. But the American public is pretty smart. If we do it fairly and honestly, they know we've got a problem, and they know we'll have to tighten our belts a little bit for a while and all pull together. That's all Japan does. We, we are a different society. We can't be like them. But when they pull on their oars, they're all together. Ours are all over the lot. We're worrying about every pressure group and interest group in the world, and it won't work that way anymore. And we'll be back in a moment. is the uh, uh, part of the Iacocca family album. Give us your shortest speech about the $20 million a year. What is this, $20 million? Should anybody make $20 million a year? No. <laughs> Start with her. Uh, no, I, I, you mean, are you talking my salary? Yeah. It wasn't my salary. Uh, Michael Jackson made a lot more, but that's beside the point. Uh, shortest speech. I, I get paid well, probably too well. I uh, get paid $800,000 a year, and I get a bonus, depending on how good a year is, of half a million. I can live well on a million three. I give the government half, or have been giving them half. But I got notoriety, as you know, last year when I sold stock that was given to me when the company was going broke for $3, and it went to 100 and I kept it. So when it got to there, I'm getting old, I sold some, and I got $20 million because everybody who kept the stock got the same 1,000% increase and I don't apologize for that because that's a system here. Uh, I give most of it to charity. I'm not going to live to be 100. I don't need that kind of money. But that's our system, and that's the kind of money I made for one year. I will drop a lot this year. I'll drop to about a million and a half. <laughs> uh, I know. <laughs> Pretty sad, huh? Um, now, you're six, uh, you, you sold seven million of the first book. I, uh, some of that went to charity, didn't it? All of it. All of it. Uh, are you going to keep this? Well, you know, what, what are you going to have in your pocket when you're fishing uh, here in the uh, senior years? You're well, going to keep the proceeds of this book, aren't you? No, it's going to... My daughter runs it. Iacocca Foundation uh, uh, funds diabetes research and education. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is a friendly question. Uh, all my adult life, I've been a, had a romance with cars. As the head of one of the largest car manufacturers in the world, what is your favorite car in, in terms of the ones you produce, and what, is the, what do you think is the best car that you produce? Well, it's easy now because we bought Lamborghini, and we have a, <laughs> and we have a Countach, a new silver anniversary model that sells for 150 grand. I drive one, but I can't afford one. Yeah. Mr. Iacocca, you've taken a lot of criticism. I just want to say I read your first book. I admire you very much. I own your first Chrysler Baron, I, which I still have, and I just bought the new Chrysler Baron convertible. I think it's the greatest car I've ever had. You're not a plant, Don't. huh? Nope. No. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And we'll be back in just a moment. Let's be impressed with Ford, the performance of Ford over doing the past. Very, yes, they're doing very well. Hi. Are you still involved with Ellis Island? Do you ever think the island will open? Oh, yes. I hope so. We collected $305 million from you people. So now up to 320. 
the island should be finished uh, next year. The Great Hall will be open, and it'll be fantastic. Will you preside in any way? Or are you going to be in the fifth row, or where will you be for this thing? I are you the... fired from that, or those? Oh things? no, no, I was in the first row. weren't you at the July Fourth celebration? I, I was, was out on the water, to be honest. You were. Yeah. You were in the front row, also. You had a big yacht, probably. No, but... no, small, <laughs> small yacht. No, I'll be in the front row. Where it's going to be a big event. Uh, Chrysler, you admit, made two goofs. How are you going to prevent a third? Oh, we've we've done more than two goofs. That <laughs> some you haven't heard about. <laughs> well, you you depend on your people. You delegate the people, and they have to be good people, and uh, they know the services job. provided and promotional fees paid by the following. At Volvo, we've been safety testing our cars almost as long as we've been building them, because we want to make sure our customers keep coming back. You can beautify and protect metal surfaces with quality True Test XO Rust Red Metal Primer, aluminum paint, and gloss enamel from True Value Hardware Stores. The Drake offers an exciting weekend in 421-0900. The Volvo spot interrupted Lee Iacocca, but they won't interrupt me saying Talking Straight is the latest uh, title of his latest book. Good evening. America, the place, the harbor of Plymouth in England. A tiny ship called the Mayflower is being boarded by 102 people. There are 70 men and women, 32 children, a handful of cocks and hens and pets, and a dog. Some of the voyagers are people who today we call pilgrims. They are leaving their homeland to seek more religious freedom in the new world.